The bed was empty when George woke up. At first he thought he must have got the sheets tied round his chest. He fingered the tightness of the bra, lazily for a second or two as if to be sure of it, and then he tried to take it off. He couldn't imagine the tricks Natasha might have showed him last night. Naturally, he could not then work out their reversal. Had to fight with the thing as he pulled it off over his head. That was better. That was all right. He threw the bedclothes aside, swung his legs around and sat, holding the bra in his fist. Everything was all right. There was lipstick on the pillow. George got up, looked at his face in the mirror. His mouth was still smudged with colour. He still liked it. Where was Natasha? He loved her. He loved her so much. Hello, Mrs. Farrance, said Catherine, putting her book to one side as she lay on the daybed. Don't you, Mrs. Farrance, me? What are you doing still in bed? I'm ill. No, you're not, said her mother. And then she laid a palm against her daughter's forehead. You feel fine today, she said. People who are well enough to throw books in rivers are perfectly well enough to get out of bed and get dressed. I am dressed. Your nighty doesn't count, Catherine. Why not? It's a dress. I think I might wear it as a dress. Get up, said Natasha. And when Catherine just stared at her, she pulled her sharply by the shoulder, yanked her upright onto the floor. Catherine's bedclothes erupted behind her, and the book slid into a loud bang on the parquet. Do as you're told, will you? Natasha shouted. Don't cry, Mummy. I'm not crying. Natasha turned and bent down to pick up the book. What have you written in your book? Why have you written this? Catherine shrugged. No reason. Everybody died before this story started. Catherine just looked at her. You shouldn't write in books. Natasha was walking towards the table. She was laying the book down on its gleaming wooden surface. It spoils them, she said. You look upset. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to shout. Natasha went outside to where she had propped open vegetable parasites and problem fungi to dry in the sunshine. She stooped to touch its pages, to check its progress, tending to it as if it were a vegetable of hers. She wondered what it would recommend for its own curative treatment. George swallowed and lit another match and lit the candle. Slowly in the wavering shadows of the beaches, the words grew over his skin. I love you, he daubed on elbow and arse cheek, calf and shoulder, twisting and stooping as far round as he could reach. It was written in black soot on his pale skin, which the late sun and shadows turned a kind of bronze underneath the beech trees. It was written different ways up and in different sizes. It was written in places you liked and places of which you were ashamed. It was written on skin that was public and private, hand and thigh, forehead and loin. Finally, it was written on his right foot. George put down the china plate when he was done and walked away towards the vegetable garden. It was not a large plot of earth. George only needed to put his foot down once and then take one more giant step to reach its centre. He took care not to step upon her vegetables. Then all that remained was for him to wait. Why didn't he come to her? wondered Natasha. Why didn't he still come to her so that she could still be short with him? She would be extra short with him at supper. She would. She felt a terrible nausea in her guts about him not coming to find her this evening. Carefully, she folded the sheets into eights and then decided she had not got them straight enough. After half an hour, the sheets were very straight. They could not have been straighter. So Natasha had to go downstairs and by now she was glad. By now the sheets had become a kind of enemy, as if they were keeping her from George all by themselves. She was feeling a little excited as she finally left the safety of the corridor and made her way softly down the narrow stair. She pushed open the door and stepped out into the hall. She had expected something to happen. She looked up the few steps that led to the door of the library, where she knew George must be hiding. He was being absolutely silent. Perhaps he was being quiet because he had heard her. 
She would be quiet until he thought she had gone. She put down the laundry and stood very still. She stood like that for 20 minutes, waiting. Still no sound from him. Natasha eventually walked towards the shallow library stair, its dark stained balustrade, and three steps up halfway, she called out, George! He did not answer her. She stared at the library door. She would not go into him, she would not. She turned and went to fetch the laundry from the floor, and down in the kitchen, she stuffed it into the twin tub washing machine with violent elbows and a slam of the lid. George, standing in the vegetable garden, watched Natasha laying the drawing room rugs out over the balustrade. She had come back into the kitchen to get a broom for beating the rugs, which she had draped over the balustrade, and then she realised that it was time to get supper on. The tinfoil shone in a bright, brave way as she wrapped it round the mackerel, and the red light on the cooker as she turned on the oven also grimly pleased her. There were still some things which obeyed her, Still some things did what she wished. But it also distressed her, the distance between these things and the one thing, the one thing she truly wanted, the one thing she had always allowed herself to go on wanting and now found herself wanting more than ever. Her husband, her only weakness. She had been wrong to trust him with it, she told herself, staring at the obedient light on the fascia. She looked around her, at all the other things in her kitchen that never tricked her, and she breathed deeply. She took a knife from the drawer with which to cut a fresh lettuce from the vegetable garden. Thank you. This is a poem called Dream Lover or Eurydice One. It's from a sequence. I think I may have been married once, but it is hard to tell. Just sometimes in the darkness I remember being held, and my skin recalls the way that sleeping with another body felt, another one than his, I mean, a man who was lighter, different. It is my back that remembers it, from neck to hips, the possible first one pressed himself against this. Lightly. Hardly there at all, a figment, I think, of foolish romanticing, unwarranted malcontentedness. That rhythmic air-filled chest, perhaps, never breathed at all. Yes, imagined, must be. Always sleeps behind me in the dream. I never see his face, you see. It is only my skin that thinks it feels another one before him, before the one who is before me now, darkly, this heavy, well-dressed kiss, promising me the present rich with the best sort of emptiness. I lift my lips to his, my thorough lover, and yes, it is good sense and a pleasure to forget. In calmness, I stretch myself out like a sky upon his bedspread. This is all, don't you think? This is everything, yes. Thank you.